my name is Duncan Epping. I'm a chief technologist working for VMware. I'm part of the uh, cloud infrastructure business group. And in our business group, we have products like, for instance, uh, VMware vSAN, vSphere, uh, VCF, uh, but also things like, for instance, VMware Cloud on AWS as part of the business group. I'm not going to be talking about things like VMware Cloud on AWS, uh, but today I'm going to be focusing on how HCI has been revolution uh, revolutionizing the data center over the past couple of years. And of course, I'm also going to talk briefly about what we're planning for uh, in the upcoming uh, years. Now, before we get started, um, you know, I think it's always good to start with a reminder to understand where we are coming from. And I think a lot of us have actually seen these screens. Uh, we've all installed Windows or DOS at some point in time. And the reason we were doing this is basically to run an application on top of a single computer. And that application was typically uh, used by, you know, someone doing the administration uh, for an office or for uh, you know a, a company, uh, but it was a limited group of people that actually did anything with computers back in the day. And if you think about it, this is not even that long ago, right? We're not talking about hundreds of years ago, but we're talking about a couple of decades ago where we're using where we were using technology like this. Uh, what we've noticed, of course, uh, as people being in IT is that the industry changed at an extremely rapid pace. Before you know it, we actually went from that single computer running a single application to having multiple computers in a computer room, something that didn't exist in most offices back in the day. So, you know, we started to come up with these neat solutions where we would have, you know, rows and rows with tables full of uh, towers. And those towers were basically in the majority of cases, the first service that people uh, were using. Now, of course, back in the days, the data centers didn't look that neat. You have, you know, all of these UTP cables running everywhere, going from left to right. In the majority of cases, I would say that, you know, a lot of these data centers looked like the data center that you see at the top with, you know, these um, slightly, you know, less than optimal cooling systems, et cetera, et cetera. Fortunately for us, things changed. Uh, things changed when VM came around, in my opinion. This is when we started to see more and more professional data centers. And that was all the result of people needing to make a change to be able to offer the business a lot more opportunities to grow uh, their business itself, to run all of the applications needed. And that's, of course, where virtualization and VMware uh, came into play. Now, all of this happened in the past 20, 25 years. And what we are starting to see is that the world is actually starting to move at a much faster pace. So what do I mean with that, that the world is moving at a much faster pace? Well, if you look at the application landscape, we've probably all seen and heard about cloud native applications. And cloud native applications are not just changing the way that the application uh, landscape looks like, but it will also change the way that you as an administrator or as an architect will be managing those systems and will be designing those systems. The key reason for it is pre pretty straightforward, right? If you look at the diagram uh, on the left side, you see what a traditional application looks like. On the right side, you see what a distributed or a cloud native application looks like. On the left side, you know, it's rather simple. You have three different layers. You have a database, you have a web server, and you have an application server, and they would typically run on some kind of ESXi host. In the majority of cases, of course, ESXi. In some cases, there may be a different virtualization platform as well. On the right side, where you have the modern application, you see that there are additional layers that are actually introduced. Things like Kubernetes, then there are web servers, there are application servers, there are databases, all of these different uh, services will need to be scheduled on some kind of platform. And this will complicate the way you deploy these applications. Now, if you look at what we have from a VM perspective, is that we have an offering that we will that will enable you to deploy these types of solutions. Now, of course, uh, you can all you can do that with the solution that we provide Tanzu, but of course there are other solutions as well that run uh, you know fine on our platform, on top of our platform. But if you look at the architecture that you will need in order to deploy that, I think it's pretty obvious that it's not as easy as people will tend to talk about it, right? When you talk about cloud native applications, a lot of people will tell you, well, you know, you run a couple of containers. Uh, those containers can potentially be scheduled by Kubernetes, but of course, Kubernetes needs to run on top of something as well. Those containers need to run on top of something as well. All of those different systems and components will need to be managed. They will need to be patched. They will need to be upgraded. They will need to be updated. Those containers may potentially 
have data associated with, associated with it. And the data, of course, needs to be stored somewhere as well. And that's typically, in my opinion, where our solution comes into play, because with our HCI offering, we can actually cater for all of that end to end. And I think that is something that will enable you as an administrator or as an architect uh, to provide a solution to the business which allows them to run these cloud native applications these modern applications on top of an existing platform that comes with all of the existing tool sets and of course maybe maybe even just as important allow you to use the same skill set on top of that because when you run these same systems you as an administrator are still managing vSphere you as an administrator are still managing vSAN you can still use the same backup tools you can still use a solution like for instance Roomcast to ensure that you're not hitting particular issues in your environment and if you're hitting those issues you can of course fix them as well and i think that is something that we bring uh, from a value perspective to you as the administrator or you as the architect now i've already mentioned it i'm going to primarily focus on vsan and i just have half an hour so what i'm going to do is i'm going to go over a couple of features which i think are interesting today and which will help you deploy these cloud native applications uh, in a more efficient way and will make make your life easier as well as an administrator. So the focus isn't purely going to be on the cloud native aspect, but it's also going to be on the operational aspect of vSAN. Now, for those who don't know what vSAN is, vSAN is a storage system and the storage system is actually embedded within vSphere. So it's not a separate solution that sits on top of vSphere. It's not a solution that you need to attach to vSphere, but when you have vSphere up and running and you go to your cluster, you know where to find HA and DRS, you can now also start enabling vSAN. And what vSAN basically does is it grabs all of the local devices in each of the hosts, so local spinning disks or local flash devices, and it will create a single shared cluster-wide data store out of it. And this data store can then, of course, be shared with your virtual machines. So if you deploy a virtual machine, or you deploy a file share, or maybe a cloud native application, that solution can actually run on top of that single shared data store that is formed out of all of those local devices in, of the, in those hosts. So that is something that is truly unique about vSAN. And why is that unique? Well, if you add additional hosts to the cluster, you can now also scale out your vSAN data store. So if those hosts contain disks or flash devices, you can now also grow your vSAN data store automatically as you're growing the compute cluster. So I think that is something that vSAN brings to the table. Now, the way you go about deploying your virtual machines or your file services, or potentially even your Kubernetes-based uh, uh, cloud-native applications is through policy-based management. So what does that mean? Well, I think the cool thing about policy-based management is basically that you can specify within a policy what the capabilities and the characteristics of a virtual machine or a virtual disk should be. Now, I've used a couple of words which some of you may not be familiar with, but when you look at a policy-based solution, Basically, what you will tend to do is you will spe specify in policy what the requirements are for the application, for the virtual machine, or for the file share. And then as you deploy that file share or that virtual machine, it's going to, uh, the vSAN is then going to look at the policy and it's going to adhere to what you specify within the policy. So if the policy, for instance, states that I would like to set an IAPS limit of 1,000, plus on top of that, I would like to have a RAID 5 configuration, then vSAN is going to make sure that that particular disk or that particular virtual machine is going to be deployed as such. So that is the important thing to understand here. The other thing which I think uh, really benefits you as an administrator is that if anything changes from an application perspective around the requirements for that application, and this of course applies to Kubernetes as well, you can simply attach a new policy to that particular virtual machine or that particular application. And then vSAN is going to reconstruct the virtual disks or the virtual files in such a way that we will actually adhere to that policy again. So if you have a self-service solution with, for instance, Tanzu, and the developer feels that that application needs to be deployed with the RAID 6 instead of RAID 1, he can simply or she can simply pick a different policy and then that virtual machine or that cloud native application um, that persistent volume that is attached to the cloud native application is going to be reconstructed in such a way that we're actually adhering to that policy. And that happens in a fully automated fashion. So that's a big benefit for you as an administrator because you don't need to move that object around from data store to data store. That all happens automatically at the back end. The other thing which I think is uh, a, 
but what I probably should say is the way that we go about doing this is from a vSAM perspective, what we've actually built is an object-based storage solution. Now, if you hear object-based storage, a lot of people tend to think about S3 storage. And as you know, S3 storage is primarily aimed for capacity, not as much as uh, for, uh, for um, uh, performance. But vSAN is not like an S3-based storage solution. So we're not talking about many small blocks. We're actually talking about virtual machines. We're talking about cloud-native applications. So in this particular case, we're typically talking about larger objects. And what you can do with an object-based storage solution, as I've already mentioned, is you can assign a policy to it. And based on what you specified within a policy, the object is going to be deployed in a particular way on your storage system. Now, the great thing, in my opinion, uh, about this is that when you do that, uh, as I've mentioned, you can specify what policy needs to be associated with, associated with, it, with it. But on top of that, you can also specify within vSAN what the data center looks like. Right? If you have a data center with multiple racks, uh, potentially multiple rooms, or maybe you have multiple blade chassis, you can actually, actually specify within the UI what the data center looks like. And now if you have a RAID 1 policy associated with it, or a RAID 5 policy associated with it, all of the data is going to be distributed across those racks, across those rooms within the same uh, building, or across those chassis, which means that if one of the chassis fails, or one of the racks fails, or potentially even one of the full rooms goes down, the data is still available. So vSAN has that capability within uh, the UI, and of course, also within the API. So if you're using a cloud native application, uh, you can also still take advantage of this full domain uh, capability. Now, let me show you what that looks like. And hopefully the demo works because this is something that, that I haven't uh, tested uh, yet, but the demo should be uh, running in a, in, in a second. So hopefully what we'll be able to uh, demonstrate if it does start, and I don't see it starting, can I click it? Nope. Well, that's unfortunate because what I wanted to demonstrate is how you can actually um, create a stretch cluster uh, configuration. So I unfortunately have to skip uh, the demo. So what I do want to briefly talk about for those customers that have a stretch cluster configuration, because it's something that uh, was introduced in Severado Update 3 uh, with vSAN, for those who don't know, when you create a stretch cluster configuration, what you will have to do is you will have to specify what the preferred location is and what the secondary location is. Uh, and on top of that, you will also need to select a witness. Now, there is a scenario potentially before Samlado U3 where if one of the two locations goes down and you lose access to the witness site, that all of the virtual machines will become inaccessible. And of course, this is something from an availability perspective that you probably should always try to avoid. And this is uh, where this new feature comes into play because with 7.0 or starting with 7.0 update three, we now have the ability uh, to actually tolerate dual failures from happening. Now, if these two failures happen at the same time, all of the virtual machines are still going to fail. However, if the secondary site in this example fails first and then the remote site is failing next, so let's say two minutes later, then all of the virtual machines that are running in the preferred location, which probably will also contain all of the virtual machines which were running in the secondary location, will actually remain up and running. So uh, that is something that we've introduced in 7.0 uh, update three. Now, when we look at the different solutions that we have available one of the other solutions that we have available and this is something that is very useful for cloud native applications is vSAN file services and of course cloud native applications are not the only consumers of vSAN file services uh, this could also be regular uh, virtual machines or uh, that need to have some kind of SMB share or an AVS share of course that those could also benefit from vSAN file services uh, but it could also be a user that needs to have access to an SMB or an NFS share you could use it for those uh, reasons as well but the initial use case that we've introduced this for was particularly for uh, cloud native um, applications now we've uh, released a couple of versions already. If you look at the solution that we have available uh, today, uh, for those who are running 7.0, if you have 7.0 update one, we actually support NFS version 4.1 and NFS version three. And on top of that, we also support SMB. So this is something that I think uh, is important to understand. Um, 
when it comes to authentication, Kerberos for NSF, uh, NFS and Active Directory for, uh, for SMB uh, specifically. So that is also something which uh, you probably should be aware of and probably what we, something that I would recommend enabling on top of that. Now, the solution itself, when we initially introduced it, as I said, it was only targeted for cloud native, native applications. And of course, we started quickly expanding the different use cases. And as a result, different questions started popping up as well. Of course, the question that popped up immediately is, would you also support a stretch cluster configuration? And the stretch cluster configuration is also something that we have uh, we are supporting. And the support for stretch cluster configurations actually started with 7.0 update 3. Oh, sorry, 7.0 update 2. So with 7.0 update 2, when you configure vSAN file services, you can actually specify, and when you start creating these file shares, you can actually specify which, which, with which location a particular share should have affinity. Now, you may ask yourself, why is VMware doing this? Why do I need to specify this affinity? Well, first of all, it's not mandatory to specify affinity for a vSAN file share. However, you can imagine that there are situations where you have applications running in the preferred location, which preferably should be accessing the file share locally instead of going over the ISL, so the inter-site link, because that will limit the latency between or the latency for that particular application writing to that file share. If the file share is reading locally, then of course that would be a big benefit. From a rights perspective, of course, you can imagine that if you have a file share um, and it resides in the preferred location and it doesn't need to be replicated, that you would like to have it accessed uh, on the preferred location as well. So that's where the affinity comes into play. Of course, when rights are being synchronized between two locations, there's always going to be traffic across the ISL, but that traffic across the ISL is then going to be from a vSAN perspective and not from a vSAN file services perspective. So that is the capability that we introduced in uh, 7.0 update 2. And of course, we also introduced some additional capabilities in 7.0 update 3. The capability that we introduced in 7.0 update 3 is more around uh, security from a vSAN file services. One of the questions that we had from customers when we first introduced vSAN file services was if we would be able to hide uh, the folders that people didn't have access uh, to. Of course, when you would set up the permissions correctly, um, no one would be able to go into a particular folder, but it still would mean that the that 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 folder, the name of that folder, would be visible uh, to the person that would have access to the share. And this is something that we've improved in 7.0 update three as well. So we now have support for access-based enumeration. Uh, for those who don't know what that actually uh, is and how that works, there's a great article by Microsoft on that uh, particular topic. So I don't have time to go into all of the details. So I would ref like to refer people to that particular um, uh, article itself. But as I said, that is part of 7.0 update three. So if you have a need for uh, ABE support, as part of your SMB uh, file share capabilities, then make sure to update to 7.0 update 3 uh, from a vSAN file services perspective. Now, of course, that's not it. If you look at vSAN itself, it's just more than deploying a cluster or more than just deploying vSAN file services, right? There are a couple of ways that you can actually start managing systems. Uh, we, of course, have the health check. Now, I know this is a Roomcast event, so I'm not going to say, you know, you should be using the health tech, you should be using Roomcast. In my opinion, you should be using both probably because they both provide their unique up, uh, capabilities. And I've been a user of Roomcast for the longest time. So I would highly encourage people uh, to look into the vSAN solution if you haven't looked into that yet. Uh, but one of the other things that we have available within vSAN, which I think is a really cool solution, is around performance management and metrics. Now, those who haven't seen it yet, some of you may have heard about it, vSAN IO Insight, or it was called VM IO Insight at first. And VM IO Insight was released as a fling a while back. And we had a lot of questions from customers if we could actually productize this feature because they felt it was very valuable. But as it was a fling, it wasn't fully supported by VMware. So that is actually what we did in 7.0 Update 1. So we brought that particular feature uh, into the UI. And if you now go to the UI and you right click a virtual machine or you right click your cluster, you can enable vSAN IO Insight on a particular virtual machine and start monitoring that virtual machine for an X amount of time. And when you start monitoring that virtual uh, machine, you will see that a 
a lot of data will show up in terms of what types of what type of IO the virtual machine is doing. And when I talk about the type of IO, it's going to provide you information, for instance, around whether it's sequel, uh, sequential or random IO, what the block sizes are, if the block sizes are aligned, what the IO size distribution is. So in some cases, you may see a lot of 4K blocks. And on the other hand, you may see a lot of 64K blocks. So all of that information is available uh, from the vSAN IO Insight interface. Now, with uh, Severado uh, Update 3, uh, we've also introduced additional capabilities around this. And some of you may have heard about this. And uh, this is something that we refer to as the IO Trip Analyzer. And the IO Trip Analyzer basically allow you to enable or enables you to monitor a particular virtual machine or a virtual disk. And it's going to show you within the UI where latency occurs on which particular latency or which particular level latency occurs so why could this be valuable well vsan is a distributed storage solution so you're using local devices which means you have a network or you're using network capabilities so you have a nick which comes into play then of course there's switches that comes into play there are disk controllers that come into play. Then there are capacity devices, caching devices, et cetera, et cetera. So you have all of these different la level layers. And what is, I would say, rather complex in most cases is troubleshooting all of these different layers. So what we have done with 7.0 Update 3 is introduce a new capability, which basically show you at which particular level latency is introduced. So if there's an issue from a networking perspective, it will show you latency that is occurring on a networking point from a networking point of view. If, for instance, the capacity disk is, uh, uh, is acting up, as you can see in this particular example, then it's going to show you this uh, red exclamation mark, and it's going to tell you how much latency is introduced on that particular layer, which will hopefully then allow you to start troubleshooting why this is happening in that particular case. And that is basically what the IO chip analyzer uh, brings to you in Samlado uh, update three. So hopefully, you know, that is something that if you haven't looked into it, you will be able to link it, look into because I think from a vSAN perspective, this is going to make life a lot easier. And you can also imagine that over time, we will be able to start acting or responding automatically from a vSAN point of view. Uh, on this information, you can imagine, for instance, that we could move components around if we know that something is wrong with a particular disk, right? We already already have some of those capabilities built in. So we already have a detection mechanism uh, when latency is occurring from a, a disk or flash perspective. So we will be able to mark those disks disk as uh, a disk we probably should be using, and we can actually move the data out of, uh, out of that disk uh, as well. Um, and then the last thing that I briefly want to cover is where we are going towards. We just spoke about some of the capabilities that we have available. So we were talking about the stretch clustering capabilities, how easy it is to create a cluster, uh, vSAN file services, how you can set that up, uh, IO Insight, and of course, the IO Chip Analyzer on top of that. But there's a future aspect as well. And if you look at where we are going toward, towards, uh, I think from a VMware perspective, there are a couple of things that we are seeing in the industry. First of all, we've spoken about HCI for the past seven or eight years. And what we're starting to see is that more and more customers are asking for us to start creating this kind of, you know, disaggregated HCI solution. And with disaggregated HCI, meaning that we customers are asking for the capability to share HCI storage capacity to non uh, HCI clusters. So uh, we already have kind of that functionality available, uh, but of course we're looking to expand that uh, capability as well. So we already have the ability to share a vSAN data store with the vSphere cluster, but you can imagine that potentially in the future, we may also be able to do that with a non vSphere cluster using, for instance, something like Project Monterey, where we can leverage smart NIC capabilities. The other thing that we're starting to see in the industry is that a lot of customers are move, moving away from focusing on storage to more focusing on data. And when it comes to data, of course, the most important thing from them being is what they can get out of the data. What does the data consist of? Is there any business logic they can find uh, in, in that particular data? And how can they uh, harvest IP out of it? And I think that is one of those things that is really uh, popping up left and right everywhere. 
The other thing that we've seen customers moving from is from data protection towards data management. And data management, in my opinion, of course, also should include data protection. But it's again, it's also about what you can get out of that data and how you can, for instance, uh, ensure that your uh, compliant to a particular uh, level of, of, of governance or uh, um, other capabilities that you need to provide. And then, of course, last but not least, we're starting to see a lot of more, a lot of customers moving from just on-premises towards multi-cloud. So they're trying, trying to create a combination of different solutions, leveraging, for instance, VMware Cloud and AWS, or potentially an Azure solution, or maybe something like a GCP or any of the other v, uh, VS, VCPP providers out there. Now, of course, that's not what, where, where it's going to end because all of these different things that we are seeing in the industry, all of these different things that are happening, of course, at some point in time need to lead somewhere. And what we are focusing on today is making sure that we're not just providing developer services, uh, for instance, by having persistent volumes available, but as some of you know, we're, we can also have the, the ability to, for instance, instantiate an S3 object storage solution on top of vSAN in a fully automated fashion. And you can imagine that over time, we will be expanding that with additional services, not just with additional services in terms of what the developer needs, but also what you as an administrator or an architect may need. So data governance, particular levels of data insights, all of those different capabilities should be available over time from an HCI standpoint, not just for what you're doing on-premises, but of course also what you're doing in the public cloud and ultimately also when you start moving towards the edge because that is one of those things that we are starting to notice uh, right now is that a lot of customers have made the swing from uh, decentralized back to a centralized solution and now starting to see the need to spin to spun out again towards these edge capabilities because simply from a data perspective they need to analyze the data as local as possible. Um, with that, we've reached the end of my session. Um, I will stick around for a bit. So anyone that has any questions, make sure to ask the questions in the, uh, the chat room. Uh, for those who don't know, by the way, uh, we've recently started a podcast. If you haven't subscribed to it yet, make sure to subscribe to it. The podcast is titled Unexplored Territory. In our very first episode, uh, our guest was Kit Colbert. It's a very interesting uh, episode, if you ask me, because Kit explains the uh, the history of vMotion. And I think he also had some, uh, some nice insights around what VMware will be doing in the upcoming years. Uh, once again, thanks for having me. And if there are any questions, happy to take those. I don't see any questions. But if anyone has anything, make sure to type fast. Yeah, sure, Alex. Um, I think that's a good question. The question is, what was introduced with update three? Um, with a stretch cluster configuration, you typically have three locations. So you have a witness location, you have a preferred location and a secondary location. The preferred and the secondary location will contain the data and the witness is acting as a quorum mechanism. So what we have introduced in update three is that we can tolerate two failures. So if the secondary location goes down, basically what normally would happen is that all of those virtual machines are going to be restarted in the primary location. Now, if at that point in time, the witness pre U3 would go down, it means that the quorum is lost because now we lost two thirds of our uh, uh, solution. So at that point in time, quorum would be lost, all of the virtual machines would power off and unfortunately would be inaccessible. With update three, uh, we now, what we do is we re recalculate all of the different uh, votes for the virtual machines or for the a solution that is running could be cloud native apps as well or uh, file shares and because we do the recalculation of the votes if the witness goes down uh, we can still keep on running even with a single location so from a stretch cluster perspective uh, that is rather unique as far as i know there aren't too many stretch cluster configure or, or solutions out there or competitors out there that could do that automatically of course solutions like netapp have the capability to manually 
uh, do a, uh, a takeover. Uh, but that's something that you will need to do manually with vSAN, with update three. Uh, in that scenario, that would happen in a fully automated uh, fashion. Um, I think I, I, I elaborated a bit on it on my blog. So if you go to yellowbrick, the, the yellowbricks.com, uh, you will probably find some more details. I'm pretty sure that uh, core.vmware.com, if you look for vSAN uh, stretch clustering, it probably will also have additional details around how that actually uh, works. No problem, Alex. I don't see any other questions, so I'm just going to stick around. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask. Doesn't necessarily need to be about the session if you need to know anything else uh, related to VMR, vSphere, HA, DRS, whatever it is, let me know. Happy to answer those. Could you please explain vSAN on public cloud? Yeah, that's a bit of a broad question. I'm not sure that I would be able to explain that in um, a relatively short amount of, of time, but I'm assuming that when you talk about public cloud, you are referring to VMware Cloud and AWS. Uh, of course, vSAN is available in other solutions as well. So Azure, uh, for instance, uh, GCP would be able to run it. Uh, we have a lot of VSPP providers uh, running it, but it's very similar to what you would do on-premises. So if you look at VMware Cloud and AWS, for instance, they are running physical hosts. Those physical hosts have uh, flash devices. Uh, in the case of, of, of Amazon, it's all PCIe-based flash. Um, we grab those local PCIe devices and we can leverage those as a single shared data store. So it's very similar to what you would do on-prem, not using you know, object storage or anything like that. It's nothing, well, but I should say it's nothing specific, but we didn't really make anything specific for uh, VMware Cloud on AWS or any of the other solutions out there. It just works as you would normally would expect it to work. I think the unique thing, though, about solutions like VMware Cloud on AWS is if you compare it, of course, to an on-prem data center, is the speed at which you can start deploying your workloads. Because normally, if you would have to set up an environment, uh, it typically takes you days, if not weeks, especially when you have different components that come into play. The hardware that needs to be erect and stacked, the networking and security that needs to be configured, in our particular case, NSX, uh, the cluster that needs to be uh, configured, vSAN, HA, DRS, all of that. Uh, if you look at VMware Cloud and AWS, it takes about two hours uh, in order to uh, to set it up. And the question, the next question is, can we stretch vSAN between on-prem and public cloud? I guess that depends on the latency. I haven't seen anyone offering that. Uh, the reason for it is is, is pretty straightforward. Uh, from a stretch clustering perspective, our requirement is, um, or the maximum amount of latency that we tolerate between two locations is five milliseconds. Uh, that will typically rule out stretching from on-prem to public cloud. Uh, we, we, you typically would be talking about, um, you know, two buildings within the same city, or you know, potentially using a fiber ring um, between, you know, cities in close proximity. This is also the reason why I think um, stretch clusters are quite popular in Europe. Uh, we don't see them too often in the US, simply because the distances between buildings, between cities, etc. Is, is much la larger, right? So it's not that big in in um, in Europe typically. Yeah, I think that's a good question, uh, Brendan. So Brendan is asking if there would be any possibilities to run the witness uh, in, in a different way, right? Now it needs to run on on vSphere, and the the question is if you would be able to. Uh, do that in the cloud. And this is actually something, it's interesting because it's something that we're already doing. If you look at VMware Cloud on AWS, uh, if you create a stretch cluster in that um, environment, we already have the witness running in a cloud. It's just being deployed uh, by us in a specific way. And this is something that we're actually uh, actively exploring. Um, feel free to send me a, um, a message on, on, on Twitter or uh, yeah, drop me an email, Brandon. It should be fairly easy to figure out my email address within VMware because it's my first name and then at VMware. Uh, if you have a particular use case for it or you have a particular customer, I would be happy to know about it so I can provide the information back to engineering because this is one of those questions that I ask as well. Uh, one of the things that I've asked for, for instance, is the ability to run 
the witness uh, as a, a native EC2 virtual machine on top of AWS, or maybe as a virtual machine on top of Azure, right? So that you as a customer would only have to pay for that single virtual machine on top of uh, AWS instead of needing to create a full SDDC to run the witness. And I know there are some uh, VMware service providers that have like a, a witness as a service uh, offering, um, but you don't see them talking about it uh, too much. And that's probably because they don't want to sell single virtual machines as a uh, as a resource. And I can imagine because there's not a lot of money probably in, in single virtual machines, but I do agree with you. The other thing that I've asked the engineering team for is not just to allow you to run the witness on top of vSphere, but for instance, to also run the witness on top of uh, VMware Workstation in a fully supported way. So hopefully that is also something that we can uh, support uh, over time because in some scenarios that may help. We have some customers, for instance, running a vSense threats cluster configuration uh, on a battleship or on a cruise ship uh, on, an, on, on an oil platform. We've, we've seen all of these weird uh, scenarios. So in those cases, you may not have three full data centers. You may just have two data centers and you know a, uh, a computer sitting, sitting in, a, in, in a random office that you potentially would want to use as a witness. So that is also something that we are uh, considering and looking into. So hopefully that's something that we can provide in the, uh, the future, Brendan. Yeah, it's good to hear that you would be interested in AWS EC2 because that's one of those things that I think would be very beneficial, especially because uh, AWS has, you know, data centers in almost every single, well, they have it in every single region and almost every single country in the world uh, these days. So that would be, I think, uh, beneficial for customers. So yeah, let me push for that. I think that is a very valuable feedback once again. Let me make a screenshot of it so don't, I don't forget. Um, next question that comes in, is there any possibility to have Tanzu plus vSAN on the public cloud? Well, in, in order to enable vSAN on anything, you need to have vSphere uh, running. So if the cloud offerings are running vSphere in any shape or form, uh, they can also offer uh, uh, vSAN. So if they want to offer vSAN, of course, they can offer vSAN. From a Tanzu perspective, again, this depends on what they would like to offer. Um, it's a capability that is part of our stack. So if they would like to offer that, then you know the, the, the full, the, they should be able to do so. There's not much more than I can, can say other than that, uh, unfortunately. So there's a lot of documentation, by the way, around Tanzu, uh, how it works, what it does. And if you would like to know a lot more detail in terms from a storage perspective, I would highly recommend following Cormac Hogan. He writes a lot about uh, cloud native applications and how you can leverage, for instance, vSAN and persistent volumes uh, to run these apps and store your data uh, persistently on top of your platform. So definitely something, um, definitely someone I, I would recommend following. Again, I would like to thank everyone for attending. Uh, if you do have the time, check out the, uh, the Unexplored Territory podcast. I've just recorded the second episode. So as I said, the first episode was, was, was with Kit Colbert. Uh, the second episode is going to be with Cezal Reddy, and Cezal Reddy came over with the Daytrim acquisition. So he's going to be talking about uh, disaster recovery and how you can recover from ransomware attacks, which is probably also something that is uh, on top of mind for a lot of you, considering uh, all of the ransomware attacks we've seen happening over the past uh, year or so. So again, make sure to check out the podcast. Uh, thanks for attending the session. And you know, maybe I'll see you guys at the VMAX soon. Thanks. <laughs>